walk in superiority, put on superiority, and walk in the authority God gave you. The spirit of humility will draw down God's ability and bring you to nobility, chosen few. Wow and wow, greetings and greetings. In the mighty name of the Lord Jesus, great to see you coming on in. Welcome, welcome, welcome to tonight's Kingdom Conversation with me, your host, Bishop Wayne Malcolm, the Business Bishop, live and direct. Always excited and delighted to be a part of your life and legacy through this ministry. And I am so happy to see my friends coming on board so uh, Kendra is on board, Christine is on board, Tina is on board, Tippinit is on board, 
and I am grateful to see you. Always grateful to see you. So encouraging to see you all coming on in every week uh, for this broadcast. Hey, Doris, great to see you. Now, uh, of course, I'm celebrating tonight. I'm celebrating. Now, I was celebrating last week. I was celebrating my birthday, but I am celebrating tonight, okay? And here's what I'm celebrating. We have crossed the line and we now have 10,000 subscribers on YouTube. Woo! And woo! Yeah, so I am really, really excited about that. And uh, of course, I know there are people out here that got millions of followers, right? And hundreds of thousands and everything else. But considering that I only really started big with this maybe just over a year ago, it really is uh, such a blessing to have been able to be a blessing uh, to so many people. So that there are 10,000 people who subscribe to the channel. And uh, I guess our pledge uh, is to keep on creating content and blessing you from week to week. So currently we post three times a week. Uh, every Tuesday is the Blessed Business Coaching Tips. Every Thursday is our Kingdom Conversation, the International Bible Study. And then on Sundays, I post a sermon and so far, 10,000 people have gone ahead and subscribed to the channel. And so, look, thank you, thank you, thank you for everyone that has subscribed, everyone that shares the content, everyone that likes the content. Let's take it to the next level. Let's go to the next 10,000. Let's go to 100,000. Let's go beyond and let's spread the message. So I'm excited about it. And if you're excited about it, uh, send up some fire in the chat box and let me know. Anthony, great to see you. Great to see you. And Yvonne, bless you all so very much. All right, so second thing I need to announce tonight, right? We're going to dive in deep. We're going to dive in deep with a very, very powerful and profound lesson, right? It's, it's going to be deep. It's going to be unpacking a mystery. And so you're in the right place at the right time. You join the conversation at the right time tonight. Uh, but later on this evening, of course, I'm in the UK and it's eight o'clock in the evening. But later on tonight at about at 11 o'clock our time, which is about 6 p.m. Eastern time. Um, but you can check it on Google, but it'll be 11 uh, p.m. our time. Uh, I'm going to be teaching a special webinar, a special webinar. Yeah. And it's a special webinar and it's entitled The Industry of Ideas, The Industry and Ideas in which I'm going to teach those who come on board, um, you know, something quite profound, quite ancient, quite biblical, quite spiritual, and yet very practical and very profitable. I'll be talking about how exactly you turn your ideas into incomes, how you turn your passion into profits, how you turn your expertise into an enterprise, and how you turn your beliefs into a business. And I guess I guess that's concerning for some people who, who never really thought that your ideas, your beliefs, uh, the conclusions you have uh, reached from your lessons in life, that those could potentially be the key to some of the prayers uh, that you have prayed about your own financial situation. Uh, but, you know, the webinar is free and the link is in the description uh, beneath this particular post on YouTube. And you can go ahead and sign up. A couple hundred people already have signed up and you could go ahead and sign up and I'm going to spend some time with you tonight uh, sharing something that I'm very passionate about, very excited about. So please do go ahead and do that. Anita, it's great to see you. Okay, are you ready? Are you steady? Then let's go. Wow and wow. Now look at this subject. I want to talk about why prayers don't work for some people why prayers don't work for some people. And of course, I'm a minister of the gospel, a duly consecrated bishop in the body of Christ, and I'm supposed to tell you that prayer works. I'm supposed to tell you that prayer changes things. I'm supposed to tell you to keep on praying and don't stop praying. But tonight, I want to I want to deal, I want to get real with you. I want to be very practical and pragmatic with you. And I want to tell you why prayers don't work for some people, okay? 
And uh, here's the outline. So I'm going to give context to the concept. Then I'm going to talk about how prayer is supposed to work. I'm going to talk about when and why it doesn't work. I'm going to, I'm going to explain why you have two ears and only one mouth. All right. And I guess some of you can figure from that that I'm going to challenge you to do twice as much listening as you do speaking. And then we're going to look at God's answer, the way that God answers prayers. OK, because I guess there is a pattern in the Bible in terms of how God answers prayers. And every pattern, when you find a pattern in the Bible, that pattern is designed to reveal a principle. So there is a principle uh, when it comes to the way that God answers prayers. I'm then going to talk about princes and beggars. I'm going to talk about the things that are already done, and then we're going to deal with the law of recognition. So I guess there's a lot to go through tonight. And, and for me, this will be a segue into my seminar that I'm teaching later on tonight, uh, my webinar I'm teaching later on tonight on the industry of ideas. But if you're already excited about the table of content and you're already excited about the subject matter, then would you please go ahead and shout your amen in the chat box and whether that's an emoji or the word amen whatever it is i, I want you to keep feeding me right so thank you tipping it i want you to keep feeding me because you know i can't respond to you in the chat box but i can see you writing in the chat box i can see what you're writing and it excites me to know that you are excited and that you are already blessed so i'm going to dive straight into the concept and, um, you know, for those who don't know, we are a marketplace ministry. My particular assignment is the assignment of Mordecai to Esthers, who have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Esthers are people who are chosen for promotion in the palaces of world kingdoms uh, in order to intercept the enemy, uh, influence culture, change the direction of an organization, a corporation, a community, a city, a nation. And these are people who are called to the marketplace. Now, I understand that the marketplace is not just a mission field, but it's also a battlefield. And so our ministry exists to support, to encourage, to enable, to empower, to strengthen those people who have that unique assignment, that Joseph type assignment, uh, you know, to influence and impact uh, on the marketplace, on the commercial spheres, uh, uh, in the spheres of influence, and to become centers of influence within those spheres of influence. And so, there will be a particular twist to this lesson because I'm really going to be talking about our our prayers that are motivated by economic factors, right? So, of course, some of you have been praying about your personal economy. Some of you have been praying about your personal finances. Some of you have been praying uh, that God will somehow get you out of the rut, somehow get you out of, of, of stuck, uh, somehow get you beyond a barrier, uh, somehow get you over the hill, round the corner, and you're looking for that breakthrough, uh, maybe a career breakthrough, a business breakthrough, a professional breakthrough, and you're praying into that particular space. And that that's all right. I think that's cool. But but I want to give a I want to give context to the concept as to why some of those prayers are not answered for some people. And here it is, right? Here it is. If God gives you a million dollar idea, then he gave you a million dollars. Oh my word. Woo! Yeah. I'm going to use my sound effects tonight, even though someone recently commented that they didn't like my sound effects. Well, I love you and I love my sound effects, so I'm going to keep on with my sound effects here. So here goes. If God gives you a million dollar idea, then God gave you a million dollars and you should stop asking him for a million dollars. Instead, ask for courage, ask for the conviction, ask for the character, Ask for the discipline, the focus, the determination, the resilience to implement your million dollar idea. Woo and wow. Now that to me is so profound. It's so profound because it says almost everything that I'm going to say in this lesson. 
It says that God answers our prayers by giving us ideas, that God answers our prayers by giving us thoughts, that God answers our prayers by giving us strategy, that God answers our prayers by giving us instructions, that God answers our prayers by giving us direction. So if God gives you a million dollar idea, then guess what? God just gave you a million dollars. And you have to now stop asking him for a million dollars and instead begin asking for the courage, the conviction, and the character to implement your million dollar idea. And how many of you can already feel that fire? And, and you're already getting a light bulb moment. You're already getting an epiphany, right? Because this to me is absolutely mind-blowing. So, so I want to I want to dive in a little bit deeper, and I want to say that from the perspective of Jesus and from the teaching of Jesus, prayer was never meant to be a hit or miss, um, occasional, uh, you know, you know, response situation. It it was intended to be something that works every time, every time without fail right? It's supposed to work every time without fail. It, it's not supposed to be temperamental. It's, it's not supposed to be uh, a hit and miss. Maybe it will work. Let's try prayer, see if that works. That was never how Jesus taught prayer. And let's read it in Matthew 7, verse 7 to 11. He said, ask and it shall be given you. He didn't say ask and it might be given you. He said, ask and it shall be given you. Seek, you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened to you. For everyone, oh my word, everyone that asks receives. And he that seeks finds. And to him that knocks, it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you whom if his son asks bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks the fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? Okay, I think we can see from that reading, and of course I could, I could use many other passages to prove that Jesus never promoted prayer as, as an optional uh, you know, potential uh, solution uh, to your problem. He never promoted prayer as something that might work. Uh, and he never promoted this hit or miss, maybe temperamental, moody God who, who sometimes is with it and sometimes is not. According to Jesus, every time you pray, God answers you. Ask, it shall be given. Seek, you shall find. Knock, it shall be opened to you. Every time you pray, everyone who asks receives. Everyone who seeks finds. Everyone who knocks, it shall be opened to them. You know, I'm reminded of a story in the book of Daniel, where Daniel prayed for, for an understanding. And he prayed for his people. And his prayers initiated a battle in the heavenlies between Michael the archangel and the princes of Persia, and there was this spiritual warfare going on, and it lasted for 21 days. And after 21 days, when Michael prevailed, he came to, to Daniel, and he said, Daniel, I've come for your prayers. He said, and the day that you prayed, I was dispatched. On the day that you prayed, I was sent. But Lo, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me these 21 days. So that's quite powerful because it tells me that God always answers your prayers and he always answers immediately. And so I've put here that prayer works every time without fail in theory. <laughs> and the reason I've said in theory is because I think we can, we can look at the body of teaching in the Bible concerning prayer and we'll reach the conclusion that in theory, prayer works every time without fail. God hears your prayer. He is not deaf. Uh, his, arm is, his, his, his arm is not short, that he cannot save. His ear is not heavy, that it cannot hear. He invites you to pray. He calls you to pray. And he promises to answer your prayers. 
That's in theory, but in our experience, in our experience, some of us have prayed about things and things didn't work out the way we thought they, they were going to work out. We've br brought certain things to God in prayer and they've still gone left, gone south, gone sour, become difficult. Um, we all have a personal experience with prayer and that's why more believers don't pray. It's not the theory of prayer. It's our experience of prayer. So I want to explain tonight why it is that prayers don't work for some people. I want to break it down. Are you ready for me to break it down? Let's break it down. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. See, if, if you're going to understand the power of prayer, you must, you must realize the difference between God's part and your part. God's part and your part. God's part versus your part. Okay? There's a part that God is responsible for. There's a part that you're responsible for. So watch this. Number one, God won't do something for you that he expects you to do for yourself. He will not reverse the roles. In other words, God's not going to do your part. <clears throat> And you're not able to do his part. So if you're asking him to do your part, that prayer is not going to work. You have prayed amiss. That prayer went left. That prayer went south. That prayer dropped before it reached the heavenlies. Because you're asking God to do something for you that he's asked you to do for yourself. Now, I'm going to give uh, a personal example, right? A personal example. So many, many years ago... And I mean, many, many years ago, before I could drive, you know, I'd been called to the ministry and we planted a church. It was quite far away from where I lived. And my prayer was was for a car. But at the time, I didn't have a driving license. So my prayer was for a license. And I got on my knees and I got before God and I said, God, I need a license. I need a driving license. I'm praying now. If I can have a driving license, I can get a car. If I can get a car, I can serve that community. I can move, you know, I can move to that area and I could begin witnessing and I could teach Bible studies and I could pray for the infirm and I could do all of these things. But God, I need a license. So here I was interceding and praying for the driver driving license. And then while I was praying, all right, God spoke to me. Woo! Yeah, I said it. God spoke to me. <laughs> okay. And I think God speaks to us all the time and he speaks to us in, 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 in our own special way, right? We hear God, we experience God in very personal ways because God understands our personality, our psyche, our character, and he speaks to us in language that we can understand. And so God spoke to me while I was praying for my license. And here's what God said to me. He said, would you also like me to go to the post office for you, pick up the application form and fill it out and post it in so you can get your provisional and start your lessons? <laughs> okay. <laughs> of course, that was... That was like a joke. And in the middle of that prayer, I started laughing. It turned into a belly laugh as I realized that I'm here asking God for a driving license and I haven't even applied for my provisional, which allows me to take lessons, which allows me uh, to qualify and get the license. I was there asking God to do something for me when actually there was a part that I needed to play. I wasn't I wasn't playing my part, but I was expecting God to do something supernatural, miraculous. I don't know what I was expecting him to do, but it was funny. He said, would you also like me to go to the post office for you and get an application, fill it out and send it off so you can get your provisional license so that you can so you can start your driving lessons? <laughs> And so I had to stop and start laughing. And, you know, some of you tonight need to stop and laugh and realize that you're asking God to do things you haven't even filled out the form yet. You're asking God for a mortgage you haven't applied for yet. You're asking God for, 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 for things you, you haven't done your part and you're out here asking him to do something. Reality is God will not reverse the roles. He's not going to do something for you that he expects you to do for yourself. He's not going to play your part 
and you simply cannot play his part. So figure out your part, play your part. When you've done your best, you can depend on God to do the rest. Can I hear an amen from somebody? <laughs> Woo! I'm glad you all get my sense of humor. You, you, you kind of realize how funny it was for me to realize that I was wasting so much time uh, in that particular prayer. So, number two. Number two, now it gets deeper. God won't do something for you that he's already done. Oh, my word. He's not going to do something for you that he's already done. Like if he's already done it and you're asking him to do it, it's because you don't realize that it's already done. You would be better off asking God to open your eyes, to help you to see what you can't see, to help you to discern, to detect, to recognize and realize the thing that he's already done. Because it's quite insulting if someone has done something for you, for you to treat them as though they didn't do anything and to still keep petitioning them, requiring of them to do for you what they've already done. And so God won't do for you something that he's already done. See, according to Acts 15 verse 18, known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. And there's a lot of other teaching in the Bible that would suggest that God concluded his work before the foundation of the world. That when God rested on the seventh day, it was because everything was done. Everything was done. And it was a matter of time before it would roll out. And so, you know, we are resting today in the finished work of Christ. We, we are resting today in the promise of Christ that it is finished. And so there are things that God has already done for you that, that you'd be wasting your time asking him to do it. But you would be you'd be spending quality time in prayer, asking him to open your eyes and to help you to see the provision he has already made, asking him to open your eyes so you can see that 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 the stone has already been rolled away. Wow. I mean, there's a couple of examples springing to my mind right now, and I think I think I'm going to share them because because for someone I don't know who you are tonight, but someone <laughs> needs to hear this. You know when the women uh went to the to the to the tomb to anoint the body of Jesus when Mary and and women went to anoint the body of Jesus they were anxious and they were concerned saying who will roll away the stone who's going to roll away the stone you know the Romans are not going to roll away the stone for us and who's going to roll away the stone so they were worried about something in the future, right? They were worried about something they anticipated, something they thought they would encounter. But when they got there, they found that the stone had already been rolled away. Woo! And I, I just said that for someone tonight who's worrying about something in the future, that God has already gone ahead of you and taken care of that. It's already taken care of. Your job is to keep moving in the direction of your destiny. Your job is to keep moving in the direction of your dream. Your job is to keep moving as God instructs you and know that he's already anticipated what might be in your way and he's already made a provision for it because he's He's the God. He's the God who sees the crisis before it occurs. He's the God um, who knows what things you need before you even ask him. And he's the God who made a provision for our salvation before we were even born. And therefore he has made a provision in your future um, that, that, that this stone you think is going to be in the way, it's already been rolled away. Your job is to keep moving in the direction of your revealed destiny. Your job is to keep moving along the pathway of purpose. Your job is to trust that every that that everywhere the sole of your foot shall tread, God has given it to you. So, so God won't do something for you that he's already done. Now, here's the third one. This is another deep one, okay? This is another deep one. God won't give you something 
that he's already given you. Ooh, oh my, uh, right, right here. God's not going to give you something that he has already given to you. Because if God gave it to you and you're still asking for it, that is, that is proof or evidence of the fact that you don't recognize or realize what he has already given to you, what's already available to you, what's already at your disposal, what's already in your hands. According to 2 Peter 1 verse 3, it says, according as his divine power has given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge, oh my, through the knowledge, through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. So according to this passage, uh, God knows everything you're going to need in order to maximize your life he knows everything you're going to need in order to fulfill your assignment. He knows everything that you're going to need, and he has made it available to you, but it's available through the knowledge, through the knowledge. So, so while we are asking God to give us things, what we really need to be asking him to do is to open our eyes, to see what he's already done, to see what he's already made available, and to open our ears so that we can, we can receive knowledge that gives us access to things that have already been provided. Now I'm going to give another scripture. And I know that this is speaking to someone. I don't know who, who this is for tonight, but if you're alive and uh, with me uh, in this broadcast and, and you know that this is your word, then I need you to start making some more noise in the chat box, right? So that I know that I'm speaking to someone, a rhema at this moment. Now, I'll share with you this story that... that the king of Syria, in the, in the Old Testament, the king of Syria suspected that a spy was in his camp. And the reason he suspected a spy was in his camp is because the, the children of Israel seemed to know his every move before he made it. Whatever military maneuver, it's, it was like Israel had inside knowledge. And and he, he was about to launch an investigation to figure out who was the spy in the camp. And, and, and one of his soldiers said, no, none of us are spies. He said, but there's a prophet in Israel. There's a prophet called Elisha. And he's telling the king of Israel what you are discussing in your bedroom. Like this guy knows what you're talking about in secret. And so if you're going to surprise Israel, you're going to have to deal with Elisha. So the king of Syria sent out a host against Elisha. And Elisha was in a little town called Dothan with his servant. And his servant got up in the morning and looked out and saw that the town was surrounded by angry troops who were coming to slaughter Elisha. And his servant Gehazi said, oh man of God, what are we going to do? We're surrounded. We're done. We're finished. What are we going to do? And Elisha prayed for his servant. And here was the prayer. He said, Lord, open his eyes. Woo! <laughs> he said, Lord, open his eyes. And when his eyes were open, he saw that the he saw that the whole situation surrounded by a host of angelic warriors and he saw that there were more for us than there were coming against us he saw that he was a majority because god was on his side he saw that the enemy was outnumbered uh you know but he saw it as god opened his eyes and so sometimes when we're panicking, when we are frightened, when we are anxious, when we are anticipating evil and disaster, the prayer is not for God to change the situation. The prayer is God open my eyes so I can see it for what it really is. Because God, if you open my eyes 
then I'll be able to see that there is no weapon formed against me that can prosper, that there is more going for me than there is coming against me, uh, that I am the majority because God is for me. And because God is for me, no one and no thing can be against me. And as you begin to see with your spiritual eyes, your confidence rises and you're ready to face adversity with a confidence and a courage that you couldn't have faced if God didn't open your eyes. So sometimes we're out here praying for God to slay the enemy when we need to pray, God, open my eyes. Sometimes we're praying for God to do something when we need to say, God, open my eyes and my ears so I can see and know what you've already done. Open my eyes and ears so I can see, so I can see the provision you have already made. Wow and wow. So I want to talk about how God answers, how God answers prayers. I love what you guys are doing in the chat box. I love it. I want to talk about how God answers prayers because this is profound. It's a mystery and it is so liberating when you understand what I've written at the bottom of this page. At the bottom of this page, I've written that prayers go from your mouth to God's ear. In the same way, answers come from God's mouth to your ear. We don't look for answers. We listen. Oh my word. See, we are busy looking for answers when we should be listening for answers because your prayer went from your mouth to God's ear and God's answer comes from his mouth to your ear. And when it comes to your ear, guess what comes with that? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. What does faith do? It gives you access to grace. What is grace? It is the warehouse, the storehouse of every provision you will ever need to be, do, and have anything that God designed and destined for you. So God, God answers our prayers through the ear gate. Someone said, no, 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 I'm looking, I'm looking for, I'm looking for an answer. The only answer you may see is with the eye of your faith, the eye of your understanding, the eye of your imagination. Because, because we walk by faith and not by sight. We walk by faith and not by sight. And faith engages the ear gate. Okay. If faith engages the ear gate. So when you ask God, so, so here's what I've written here. Okay. So faith gives access to grace, right? So we know that we are saved by grace through faith, right? So, so grace is the source, right? But, but faith is the access. It's the door. So grace is the great provision, but faith is the door. And without faith, certain things are impossible. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Without faith, you enter this world of impossibility. But with faith, you go into this realm called grace, and it's manifold. It's not just grace to save you from sin. It's grace to heal, to deliver, to prosper, to promote, to protect. It's everything that you will need in order to carry out your assignment is in the arena of grace. But we get into that arena by faith, right? But where does faith come from? Faith comes by hearing, hearing, hearing the word of God. That's where the faith comes from. So if you pray, if you pray, watch this. If you pray for things, God answers with thoughts. My word. If you pray for things, God's answer will be to give you thoughts. You asked him for things, he'll give you thoughts because thoughts are the source and the origin of things. So when you ask for things, he gives you thoughts. And if you ask for things and look for things, you think God didn't answer your prayer. But if you ask for things and listen for thoughts, you realize that God did answer your prayer. You asked and it was given. You sought, you did find. You knocked, the door was open, but it didn't come in the package that you wanted it to come in. You want things to show up as things, but things show up as thoughts before they are manifest as things. That's how the kingdom works, right? 
So in the kingdom of God, uh, thoughts are things, and God gives you thoughts so that you can materialize things with those thoughts. If you pray for success, guess what God's going to give you? He's going to give you a strategy. <laughs> He's going to give you a strategy. He's not going to just take you supernaturally from where you are and 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 transport you and 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 offload you where you want to be. No, he's going to take you through a process as you follow a strategy, okay? Now, if you want some, some more scripture for this. So, Noah, Noah, I'm going to destroy the world. I'm going to save you and your family. Okay? Cool. Now here's the strategy. Build, make thee an ark of gopher wood. Pitch it inside and out. Make it three stories. Put storage rooms, one door, one window. Make the ark. Get in the ark. Bring the animals into the ark and wait. What is that? Strategy. God saved him by a strategy. Moses, Moses, the firstborn in Egypt will die tonight. But if you will follow the strategy and put the blood of a lamb upon the doorpost and the lintels of your house, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. So Moses obeyed a strategy, and it was obedience to the strategy that put a difference between Israel and the Egyptians on that dreadful night. Listen, when God answers your prayer for success, he does it by giving you strategy, because there's your part and there's his part. Your part is faith, and you can't even demonstrate faith evidence faith outside of your obedience to the strategy. When you ask God for prosperity, he will give you a plan. Oh, you asked him for prosperity, but you sat there, folded your hands and started looking for a check in the mail. You sat there in your rocking chair, waiting for someone to knock on the door and give you a bag full of money. Uh, those prayers don't work, my friend. <laughs> I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news, but you may rock yourself to death in that rocking chair, waiting for someone to show up with a bag of money. Instead, when you ask God for prosperity, you must now tune in with your spiritual ear because what he's going to give you is a plan. He will give you thoughts. He will give you strategy. He will give you plan. That's how God answers your prayer for things, for success, for prosperity. And here's what it means. It means that if God gave you a million dollar idea, I know I said this at the beginning, but I got to say it again right now. If God gave you a million dollar idea, then guess what? God already gave you a million dollars. Wow, and what, so that's a glockenspiel, an air horn, and an applause. If God gave you a million dollar ideas, as far as heaven is concerned, you are in possession of a million dollars. And and see, this this is this is a realization that the marketplace um is 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 agreeing with in 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 very real in a very real sense because the marketplace today has come to value uh has come to value what we call a knowledge worker a knowledge worker because what organizations and corporations realize is that the value of the organization is between the ears of the knowledge workers
so that if we lost everything, if the building burned down, but the people survived, we could go across the road, lease another building, get some more equipment and be back up and running in no time at all. Because the real value in their business is the knowledge base. It is the knowledge worker. It is the ideas between the ears of their knowledge workers. And so the marketplace now realizes that true value, true value is in the quality of your ideas, your knowledge, your thought. And so when you ask God for something, he gives you true value. He gives you the source, not simply the supply. Okay. Uh, you know, it's like, it's like uh, Peter and John at the beautiful gate of the temple in Acts 3, going to the temple at the hour of prayer a lame man is begging and he says, he says, look, uh, you know, arms, arms, can I have a penny? Can I have a coin? Can I have some money? And Peter said, look at us, look in my eyes, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I to thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. In other words, I'm not going to give you what you want but I will give you what you really need. Because if I give you a penny right now, I'm going to reinforce and endorse your status as a beggar. But if I enable you to walk, I am going to open up a new opportunity for transforming your personal economy. I'm going to enable you. And so the reality is when you ask God for things, he's not just going to give you the thing. He's going to give you the thoughts that produce the things so that you never, ever run out of the thing. If you ask God for success, he's going to give you the strategy that produces success so that you never run out of the success because you always have the root cause, which is the strategy. If you ask God for prosperity, he's going to give you the plan because the plan is the root cause source of the prosperity. So the question is, what if God already gave you a million dollars and you're still broke? Is it possible that God gave you a million dollars and you're still broke? Yes, because you haven't recognized, realized the power of a God idea. You haven't committed to implementing the idea to pursuing the plan, to executing on the strategy. Uh, you, you haven't committed to it. And so what you have is a million dollar idea and you still don't have the million dollars. And this is an evil that uh, King Solomon saw under the sun. I'll read it to you. He said, there is an evil which I've seen under the sun as an error which proceeded from the ruler Folly is set in great dignity, and the rich sit in low places. I have seen servants upon horses and princes walking as servants upon the earth. Wow, what is he seeing? He's seeing people living beneath their privilege. And he's seeing people who are not as smart, not as wise, not as, as virtuous, not as godly enjoying the best of the world while princes and people that are chosen are, are sitting in low places and walking as servants and beggars on the earth. Why is that dispar Why does that ex disparity exist? It exists because so many of us don't understand that God has already answered our prayers by giving us million and multi-million dollar ideas, by giving us pathways to prosperity, by giving to us a plan, a strategy, and a system. And we, we haven't recognized that we are in possession of true value and haven't committed to it, and but we're waiting for it to appear suddenly in some physical form when God has already given it to you in spiritual form. And this is what I believe David meant when he said 
in Psalm 37, verse 25 to 26. I've been young and now I'm old, yet I've not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. What? I've, I've never seen the righteous. For, what is he saying? He's saying God has never left the righteous without a seed, without something. He never leaves you without something. See, look, if you're down to nothing, God's up to something. All right. And the reality is that something you already have from God is the key to everything else that God has promised you. But it's a waiting for you to recognize its seed potential. It's a waiting for you to recognize that actually this thing that I have is a key. And keys don't look like the doors they open. Okay? Keys don't look like the worlds that they that they unleash. Keys don't look like the vehicles uh, and the, the, the engines that they start. But see, this little thing you have, it could be a skill, right? It could be ex an experience. It could be some knowledge, right? It, you know, it could be some advice and wisdom. This little thing you have is the key to everything else God has promised you, if only you will recognize it. And this is the law of recognition. This is the law of recognition. This is so important. Your prayer life is never going to be fulfilling. It's never going to be effective until you activate the law of recognition. Because often God has answered your prayers. He is, he is delivered on everything that you ask for, but you don't recognize it because it's not packaged the way you thought it should be. So watch this. Matthew 13, verse 12, for whosoever has to him shall be given and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever has not from him shall be taken away, even that he has. Now, I want you to see the anomaly. I want you to see the anomaly in the passage. I want you to realize that latter clause for whosoever has not from him shall be taken away, even that he has. Well, if he has not, then what was there to take away? According to Jesus, he who has not always has something, right? Because if he has not, it will be t what he has will be taken away. So he does have something. So who said he has nothing? Who said he has nothing? It's him who said, I have nothing. It's him that looked at his something and called it nothing. Whereas somebody else looked at their nothing and called it something. And if you call your something nothing, you will lose the something you have. But if you call your nothing something, you will attract more. It's a principle and a mystery of the kingdom. You have to now say, I have something. You don't, you don't pray for victory. Listen to me. You pray from victory. I wish I had some help in here. Oh my, you don't pray for victory. You pray from victory. You assume the posture of victory and say, God has already given me victory. God has given me everything I need that pertains to life and godliness. Now, Father, I thank you for all that you have already done and for all that you have made available to me. Now open my eyes that I may see the things that have been freely given to me of God. Open my eyes and my spiritual ears that I may discern a direction, a strategy. Open my mind so that I can begin to imagine a new uh, reality. These are effective prayers. They're always answered. <laughs> They're always answered. They are always answered. Where the other prayers, where you're asking God to do something for you that you're supposed to do for yourself, that don't work. You're asking God to do, uh, uh, to do something for you that he's already done, that don't work. You're asking God to give you something that he's already given you, that don't work. But as you begin to recognize, recognize, recognize that you have something, you were never left, you were never forsaken. I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. So... Tonight, 11 o'clock, the, the link to sign up is in, the, is in my uh, 
description beneath this video in uh, on YouTube with my 10,000 subscribers. What you need to do is sign up for the web for the webinar, totally free, and I'm going to show you the oldest and most lucrative industry on earth. It is the industry of ideas. And I will prove to you that God has not left you with nothing. You are in possession of something. In fact, more than you can imagine. You know what? When you visit another country, when you visit another country and you go through customs and they ask you if you have anything to declare, are you carrying currency uh, uh, more than a certain value? You can safely answer no, right? You can answer honestly and say, no, I'm not carrying that amount of currency. But you can walk into that country with a billion dollars between your ears, a billion dollars in your mind, a billion dollars in, in, in God ideas. You carry billions in your mind. If only you will realize that from the heavenly perspective, if God gave you a billion dollar idea, God gave you a billion dollars. Your job is to say, God, open my eyes, open my ears. Give me the courage, the character, the conviction, the discipline, the focus, the resilience to implement these ideas, to follow through on the strategy, to make it happen. And see, I'm going to talk about that tonight, but I'm going to give some detail. I'm going to show you how you can convert your ideas into an income, your passion into profits, your words into wealth, and your expertise into an enterprise. If you're on the East Coast, it's going to be about 6 p.m. If you're in the United Kingdom, it's a late one. It's for the insomniacs among us. It will be at 11 p.m. I'm going to take a nap between now and then. Uh, if you're not on my mailing list, you need to watch this video, and then I'm going to look at your comments and play some lovely music as we conclude tonight. Shalom. Whoops. Okay, that video is not available, so we're not going <laughs> to... <laughs> I just realized that I rearranged my desktop entirely, so those videos are not available. <laughs> All right? Uh, listen, I love your comments. Hey, guys, 10,000 subscribers on YouTube. That's crazy. Uh, I'm going to shoot a video to thank everyone for subscribing to my YouTube channel. I want to encourage you to share it. If you haven't already subscribed, subscribe, share, like the post. Let your, let your friends, family, neighbors, networks know. The Business Bishop is live and direct every Tuesday, every Thursday, every Sunday. Click the bell for notifications. It'll tell you when we are going live. And I am so excited about that. All right, let me play you some music and let's look at your lovely comments. Uh-huh. I know they're talking about you. And I know it's been getting to you. And I know that things are hard and times are tough. But you know what? I got good news for you. You're totally unstoppable.
chance and opportunity. Every rock I see a stepping stone. The only limitation is in my imagination. Doesn't matter what they say, I'm gonna do it anyway. There's no triumph without a trial, no gain without the pain. Without a mess, no testimony without the testing. So step by step, totally unstoppable. Totally unstoppable. Totally, totally, totally unstoppable. You know I'm totally. Unstoppable. I'm a totally unstoppable. 